Welcome to This Organized Life. If you're a mom, wife, or coffee lover seeking advice on how to reduce clutter and reclaim time, look no further than your host, Lori Palau, founder of Simply Be Organized and author of Hot Mess, A Practical Guide to Getting Organized. For a lot of people, clutter is their dirty little secret, but it doesn't have to be. Each week, we will share practical tips, chat with experts, and provide strategies on how to keep you organized. I hope that by sharing our stories, you feel a little less alone and more empowered to tackle the areas that are holding you back. So let's get started. Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's episode of This Organized Life Podcast. I am your host, Lori Palau, and I'm really, really, really jazzed for today's episode because I'm having a little bit of a fangirl moment. Um, First of all, we're going to be continuing in our, our summer series of Clutter and the Enneagram. So if you're just tuning in for the first time, you don't have to, but you might want to go back and listen to our previous episodes. We've interviewed Enneagram ones, twos, and threes. Today, we are up to our Enneagram fours who are known as the individualists, the romantic, they have a few different names, love our Enneagram fours. And when I was prepping for the show, I knew I wanted this one particular guest. I was like, okay, I'm going to reach out to her because the last time we did an Enneagram series, I had reached out to Ian Morgan Cron to be a guest. And he was, and that was like huge fan boy moment. And so then I said, okay, well, who else do I know that's an Enneagram for that I would think would be a huge value to my audience? And I was like, well, I follow the, this group or this, this, um, social media handle used to be called Leanne and Michelle, but now it's called top not comedy and Leanne Deering is an Enneagram four. And so I reached out to her, didn't know her at all. And she was so gracious, Um, and said, yes, I would love to come on. But in addition to her like social media viralness, she's also a full-time entrepreneur. She and her husband own an acting studio and she's a homeschooling mom to four kids. She's super busy and I cannot wait to talk organization and clutter with her because she she obviously has to be organized to do all the things that she's doing. And I think that's going to be such a value treat for our Enneagram fours. Um, So without further ado, I would like to come and welcome my friend Leanne to the show. Welcome Leanne. Thank you for having me, but hold on. You did not tell me that I had to follow Ian Morgan Cron. I call him Sir Ian Morgan. I, I know you do. I listened to the episode when you guys were on it and I was like, what? Yeah. Girl, Lori, uh, those, I mean, these are some large shoes to fill. I will do my best. You, uh, I have so much faith. It's not even question. I don't, people get excited about like other celebrities. I couldn't care. No offense, Kim Kardashian, but I don't care. Don't care. So yeah, I, what I, what I said, my hand to God in that (laughs) intro is the truth. Like I was, when I did the first series on Enneagram and clutter, I was like, I am going for Sir Ian, because why not? And then the second round, um, you, you were my number one. You were my number one. So I, it is, I, I, well, again, it's amazing. So tell our listeners, give them the backstory on you. And I feel like, especially our listeners who are Enneagram junkies, like myself know who you are, but for those who live under a rock and might not, (laughs) a YouTube Enneagram content rock. Um, okay. So, so when you say, give me the elevator pitch, you want me to take you all the way back to 1983, a chilly November morning in Long Island, or should we start with like the commercial acting and content creation? I assume you mean, well, the fact that you asked the question just summed up an Enneagram four right now and we're done. Um, I'll let you pick it up however, and wherever you would like, and wait, are you really from Long Island? I am from strong Island. Are you? Where? No, but well, my no. well, tri-state girl. Wait, I'm well. My husband was born and raised in the Lower East Side of Manhattan, okay. and okay. we got married in Long Island because we couldn't afford to get married in the city. So I got married. In, Where'd you we get married? In Glen in Glen Cove. Okay, what was the name of the place? The Metropolitan. The, the Metropolitan. Metropolitan. I totally know. The On Glen Cove Road, <laughs> town. So I'm like not that far from where you got married. Yeah, I know exactly where you are. Mm. Crazy. 
Oh my gosh. Did you vacation in the Hamptons? Were you, did you go out to the Hamptons? I mean, no, not all that often. Very, very infrequently. We, um, yeah, we grew up on that. We went into the city sometimes growing up, but it was, I mean, I loved growing up on Long Island. It was a really great place to live as a kid. Everything around us was like woods and we would ride our bikes way into the woods. And there were these, this is going to sound so crazy, but there were these like old abandoned houses at this horse park and my brothers and I would go play there and they were like our secret clubhouses. So no wonder I turned out to be a four because I was like, gr I grew up playing in these, you, you know. You like, had this whole imaginary <laughs> world happening. Yeah. Yeah. And it was a very simple, I mean, I feel really fortunate that I grew up in the eighties and nineties. It was a lovely time to be a child. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Well, my, my, our one daughter who is an Enneagram for mm -hmm. all she wants to, I mean, she could live in a John Hughes movie. Like that's her life. Like she thinks her like when she went to high school, she was like, I really just wish I would go to like, I wish our school looked like like the high school and the breakfast club. And I'm like, okay, it doesn't, but you know, that's, that's it. But she's obsessed with the eighties and the nineties and was like, I wish I was a kid in that time. So there's a word for that, a beautiful word. And I hope I'm going to say it right. I know how to spell it. It's spelled F E R N W E H. And I think it said Fernwe. Okay. And it basically means like yearning or homesickness for a place or time that you've never existed. Ooh. And I feel that affinity for a number of different realities, like the Harry Potter world. <laughs> like sometimes I get homesick for Hogwarts. <laughs> weird, you know, weird experiences like that. But um, that's what your daughter is having. You can you can name Perfect. that. I can name it. Great. I love it. Yeah. So okay, so grow grew up on the East Coast. Yes. And then how and then made your way where? Give us give us the short version and then bring us up to the whole Enneagram life. Okay, I'm gonna do that. I'll give you the, the eagle eye view. Um, okay, I went to college in Boston for a couple of years and then I did a, a couple of months in Thailand just with a missions trip. And when I came back from that time in my life, greatly needed a change and my family had just relocated to Arizona. And so I followed them thinking, I'm gonna just finish my college experience in Arizona. If I like it, I'll stay. Um, if I don't, then I'll move back to the East Coast and do what I'm going to do. So I met my husband several months after moving out to Arizona. We, it sounds very, very cheesy, but I knew within weeks of meeting him that I was going to marry him. I, I was just going to say, are you, I feel like you're going to tell me you had some sort of fairy tale romance and that was... It, yeah. He's adorable, by the way. I mean, I, I was doing a little Instagram stalking of your family a little bit. Um, not going to lie. He's, he is adorable. He's like an amalgam of just so many Hollywood men, isn't he? Like, he's got like, well, you're fat you like all of it. Well, look at, well, you're stunning. And your kids are like, I was like, oh my gosh, I am not, but you're like goals, you know, family, wholesome family goals right there. So sweet. He's an amazing man. Um, also, and I just feel like I knew within a very short time that I was going to marry him. So we dated for eight months and then we were engaged and we started the studio when we were engaged. Now the studio was like the definition of humble beginnings. We had nothing. I had student loan debt and nothing else <laughs> to bring to the marriage. Okay. So we started living in his parents' basement for the first nine months of our marriage. And we just saved up everything we could because we had this vision and we, were, we thought, let's just use whatever we have. Let's throw all of our energy and passion at this project because we really believe in it. We really think we can get this off the ground. And we started teaching acting classes in his father. His father is a family doc, uh, had his own practice. We said, hey, can we use your lobby at night when no one's there? And he was, Stop. I love it. He said, okay, I guess so. So we would go in there at night and we would take down the medical plaques and put up pictures of Al Pacino. And we started teaching acting classes in this lobby at night. The year was, I guess, 2008, 2009. Um, and yeah, that's where we began our business. So we outgrew that space, thank God, very quickly, about a year. And then we moved inside of a production studio, outgrew that space. And then we've been at our current location for the last over a decade now. Wow. So yeah. living together, working together, your homeschooling mama, like there's a lot of togetherness in yes. that family. And yeah. how have you, do you drink heavily? Like no, how do you, how do you, man? <laughs> I've been fully sober for five years. Interestingly, Ian and I got into that on his podcast. Oh um, yeah. That's, that's a, another journey that the Lord kind of took us on, but it was um, the way I see it is that the family is 
I'm a Christian, so I'm going to use Christian language. And you're listening. I am, and I am as well. So not all of our listeners are, but a good Correct. portion use of them are. But, but yep, yep. Um, I believe that the family is a highly sanctifying and ordered gift from God. And so all this time together is constant refinement for us. It's constant having to confront where are the places that I'm naturally lazy, naturally selfish, getting better at apologizing, um, seeing the gifts contained in one another, learning how to uh, put one another first, how to serve. We brought a new baby home this past year. That was a major lesson for the children is how can I how can we serve and love the most vulnerable person among us right now who happens to be a baby? What does that look like in this season? So to me, all that time together is a pure gift. And I continue to ask God for eyes to see it that way, because there are days where it doesn't feel like that. Of course, I'm not some sure. like angel walking around like, this is wonderful. All this chaos is so beautiful. There are days where I want to hide in the closet or do hide in the closet, but it's um, overall I feel like God is teaching me to see the people in my space at, for the gift that they are. I love that. <laughs> I, I love it. And it's a, and it's a perspective thing. And I'm curious to kind of walk, I want to maybe sidestep. I don't want to say jump ahead, but walk me through the Enneagram because I want to tie this back. I want to tie what, what you just said also back to the Enneagram. So tell us a little bit about your type how you learned about the Enneagram, and then we can kind of go on from there. So I'm in a homeschool mom's book club, and I kept hearing Ian's book mentioned, The Road Back to You. I kept It kept coming up, uh, and women were talking about how impacted they were by it. And so I thought, oh, I'll just check it out. So I read it, and my friend Michelle, who creates content with me under uh, Top Knot Comedy, was reading the book at the same time. And I was sort of skeptical because I was a psychology major. I'm really familiar with a lot of the personality tests and I had to take many of them as part of the major. And I never found any of them to be incredibly helpful to me, to be very honest with you. Maybe pieces of them were. Mm -hmm. uh, I came to the chapter on the Enneagram four and I cried so hard. I remember feeling like I had just had somebody explain myself to myself <laughs> it felt like this moment of being seen which to a four is very significant to feel mm -hmm. seen and to someone assist me in giving words to this kind of this sort of inner wrestling that I've had in a lot of areas that I had never really been able to I'd never been able to name it mm -hmm. um and really what it was was the belief that somehow I was defective or missing something that there was something missing in me that everyone else had and that they all had this belonging that I was just as much as you might want to and as much as you might long for it, you're never gonna be a part of this, whatever this thing is. And you're the only person who feels this way and you're the only person who operates this way. Looking back now, I can see the madness in my logic. I can see almost the hubris in it as well to think that I am the only person who's ever felt this way. I mean, that's a pretty grandiose, <laughs> That's you know, it's pretty absurd. But um, until someone tells you that, something isn't true, sometimes you don't see it. So finding this personality tool, the Enneagram personality tool has been helpful for me for personal relationships, work relationships, um, rhythms for my life, my walk with God. It's been helpful in so many areas. And I love what, I, I love what you said because I was not a psychology major. I like to pretend I'm a psychologist, like I play one on TV, but I, <laughs> was very, I've always been very fascinated with personality typologies. And one of the things that I talk about quite a bit is, you know, I've studied or taken, I shouldn't say I've studied, but like I've done Myers-Briggs and I've done a bunch of other personality typologies. And it's been, okay, okay, it's been nice to know, but there's nothing I've ever been able to do with that. Like mm -hmm. there's like, what do I do with this? Right. Okay. So here are my, I know this about myself, but there was no application yeah. once I had that. And I know for myself, I felt like, okay, again, like you, and I'm an Enneagram eight. So I feel oh, like- Oh, are you? Yeah. I love eights. I love eights. I'm an, I'm an eight with an eight wing. I'm like a tried and true eight. And so um, people either love eights or they don't. <laughs> I, don't I think it's like, oh my God, I love your honesty or oh, you're scary. It's one or the <laughs> other. Um, but I love that 
there's, you can take it and then apply it practically in your life. Like you said, in all aspects. And that's really the kind of the work that we're doing with, with any women clutter. I have a daughter who's a four. So everything that you're saying, I have a little bit of an ulterior motive in this conversation because I am, I, I use the word broken a lot. Like my is, I feel like she feels broken. Like she doesn't belong. Like she's like, like a wounded bird broken. And I don't know if that's just because she's an adolescent, if that is part of her Enneagram fourness, but like, she's like you said, like, she's never going to be part of the group. She's never going to belong. She's an out, but that's self-inflicted. It's not like we're like, get away. You're not part of us. I don't know how, and again, I don't think I can, I can't fix anybody, but I'm wondering if that's something that is true to that Enneagram for like you just, I'm accepting that my lot in life is that I'm different and I'm, I'm not like the norm. And I, I'm just curious if you, you know, if you feel like that's something that maturity or just knowledge or life experience, or maybe you never even felt that. Um, but I've talked to a few fours and that's, they've said that they've had that sort of feeling and I see it in her. And when I look at you and I'm like, oh my gosh, she has it together. I'd like to have some words of wisdom of, you know, how have you've worked through that to be the best, healthiest version of yourself? I'd like to thank you for that easy softball question. First of mm-hmm. all, <laughs> yep. no, I, my, my first impulse is like to hug her, um, I think about this a lot. Like if I could go back and I could sit down and I had 20 minutes to talk to Leanne when she was 16, how old is your daughter? 18. 18. Oh, you couldn't pay me to go back. I know. Right. Um, we've got to be so tender with these young ones, but the central wounding message of the four is really I'm defective and therefore unlovable. And Mm -hmm. so the biggest way that you can combat that is to, and as an eight, this will come naturally to you, is to stay in the ring no matter what comes up, no matter how, you know, she may be having a day where she's angry or hostile or acting in a way that she seems like she doesn't want connection to you sometimes. Because fours are subconsciously often testing the people around them to say, this thing that I believe about the world that I'm unlovable. Well, let's see if it has legs. I did this in college. Mm -hmm. I would get into these patterns of friendship and behavior where I would test people to see how strong their love was to see if they would come after me. Right now, ultimately what I have learned is the heart of God will always come for me, will always Mm -hmm. pursue me. And that's where I have found Again, I know this won't apply to all your listeners, but that's where I have found my healing is in Jesus Christ. But in the people, sometimes, you know, the word of God calls us to be the hands and feet of God to one another. So what that looks like for a mother and a daughter is it's a complicated answer, but perhaps the root is simple, which is that I I stay in the ring with you no matter what. You do the Mm -hmm. ugliest thing to me. You say the worst thing to me. You push me away. You ignore me. You provoke whatever it looks like for her. I don't, I don't know your daughter. I have a million questions. I wish we had hours to talk about this. Um, But the message that keeps coming from you is you regulate yourself and you Mm. say, I understand you're hurting and I'm, I'm sorry. And I wish I could take it from you, but I want you to know that no matter what, I cherish you, no matter what I'm here for you. I am in the storm with you. I'm beside you. We don't need to fix it, but I'm Mm -hmm. with you. Um, Cause that's the four's gifting is to be in, in their storm or in another person's storm with them and not need to fix it. So if you can offer that to the four in your life and you stay regulated mm-hmm. because the four is already going up and down wildly in her feelings. She is. And especially for an 18 year old, my gosh, I remember it. The hormones take you on these wild rides and the life lesson for the four is stay in the center of the boat, stay in the middle, try to regulate mm-hmm. those highs and those lows as best you can both through life rhythms for me, through prayer and, and my walk with God, through the boundaries I set up for myself. Um, she's young. She's just at the start of learning all of those things. But if you teach her that you're not going anywhere, I think that's, a, and I'm sure you have taught her that and yeah. are continuing to reinforce that message. I think that's really important. 
Well, thank you for this therapy session, Leanne. I really appreciate it. And I'm sure our listeners are really grateful because they decided, hey, I'm going to tune in and learn about Enneagram and Clutter. And now we just had a therapy session about (laughs) Logan. So that's awesome. Thank you. Um, No, that is very, those are wise, wise words. And um, I really appreciate it. And so, yes, thank you. We will continue to continue to follow along on that journey with her. But um, so you you learned about the, you read the book, all of a sudden yeah. you were like, light bulb goes on. How did you decide for those of you who like know and follow you on YouTube and on social media, how did you guys decide to make the leap into incorporating this into your professional world with acting and all the sure. things? Okay. So my husband and I, as you pointed out, um, we own and operate the Deering Acting Studio together. So we are working actors in Arizona. That mostly looks like commercials. That's kind of what's in the market out here, but it's been a lot of fun. And I met Michelle. We did an improv show together at a church in Scottsdale. Hold on. I want to get my timeline right. 2018, 2017, 2017. Okay. Um, and then we started doing internet comedies together and had a few things go viral. So we found the Enneagram a few years into our comedy creation journey. Oh, oh, dad, three-year-olds. No, we're good. You're good. Okay. If we have to, we have three-year-olds in the back. Remember homeschooling mom and with littles. So, and a baby, yeah, and a baby, napping, but I have his monitor going. So, okay. I'll go get him and he'll finish the interview with me. Um, okay. Where was I? Any of Yes. We were so inspired by it that we started creating these YouTube videos. And then those kind of developed a little cult following. And those totally so much fun to create. We really kind of fell in love with the personality types that we had created and loved putting them in new situations to see what they would do. So we just, we just kept going with it. Oh my God. They're hysterical. You guys, you have to go back and it, you have to follow them because they're hysterical. And they, and each, both Leanne and Michelle will play different Enneagram types in different scenarios and they're flipping hysterical, like, (laughs) and so on point too. Um, I love it. I love it. So I guess totally lost my train of thought. So again, I'm like, wait a second. Now, do you find that you, as somebody that's obviously studied all the different Enneagram types, because you've applied them in your work. And I talk all about the value of knowing all the different Enneagram types, not just your own, because relationally we live, work, interact with people of all different walks of life. And just seeing how other people see the lens that they see the world is so powerful. Um, I'm curious to know what that how that has impacted your relationships, knowing that like, because what type is your husband? My husband has not read the book yet, oh. which is a pain what? point in our marriage. My, I mine know, ha- mine is, my, mine hasn't either, although he's a three. No, you're not supposed to type the people. No, my- he's taken, he's taken a test. I mean, he's taken it, he's read it and he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like he knows he's a three, but, um, but he refuses to read the book like cover to cover. Okay. Out of principle. Three and an eight would be a really good pairing, I feel like. Well, we can talk about that. We are, we are, we can be very, very healthy and powerful, but we can also be really unhealthy because we're both a million miles an hour and we're yeah. both in the aggressive stance. So we're both forward thinking people. And mm-hmm. so we're very goal oriented. We both talk a million miles an hour. We are yeah. both doers, um, but we don't hold a ton of space intuitively for our four nines. Like as my kids were younger, now that I know the Enneagram when they were younger, I was like, I was a horrible mom because I, you know, I probably wasn't, but I feel like I am. And you know, they're whatever. Again, we're back into therapy, but my point is um, we could be intimidating. We could be a lot. And when you've got, you know, a four and a nine kid that could be a little overwhelming three, eight. Combo. Yeah. I, I could see how a healthy three and a healthy eight though, would be so dynamic together. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's why God gave you the children that you yes. had your four and your nine, your little peacemaker and your big feelers probably slowed you down and forced you yeah. into your body at times when you didn't want to do that. Right. The, Absolutely. The eight is in the, that's the anger triad, not the head triad. Yes. So, no. Yeah. yeah. We're, we're all gut anger doers yeah and you know my feeler you know my 
my four, everything had feelings. Mm -hmm. She was actually on my show years, a couple years ago. And she was talking all about, cause she also has ADD and she's really open about talking about it. Wonderful. And she talks about how she had magical thinking and everything had feelings. And when I, as a professional organizer by trade, it's like poetic justice that you have a kid that thinks every little, you know, bottle cap is, has a personality and there's a story and I'm just like, oh my gosh. So that you want to talk about God giving you a lesson to slow you down, but it helped me to really refine kind of the strategies that I use. And this was way before I even knew the Enneagram about looking at physical clutter and emotional clutter and calendar clutter and all of these different types of how clutter shows up in our world mm -hmm. and where different people struggle and where different people thrive. And then yeah. knowing the having learned the Enneagram to layer on top of that, it's been like, ah, oh, to be able to say, again, give you language and understanding about, oh, I knew this and this is why, or mm -hmm. this gives an explanation to this. And here are some specific strategies that we can apply. Yeah. Um, Wonderful. But, yeah. But I want to talk for a second. So your husband hasn't read the book. I want to get back because I want to, I do have a lot of questions about you as a four specifically for organization, but talk to me a little bit about your husband, where you, where he, he has to have some idea of what type he is. I have a guess. And what I think he, I think he is a seven. He's not a manic seven. I, I think he's a seven with a balanced wing and a, and a very healthy one. He's become a very disciplined seven, but where I really see that showing up is that he will do whatever he can to avoid unpleasantness. Mm. He'll, you know, if something's not going well, the first thing he'll say is, we don't need to stay here. No, this is okay. Let's, we're going to think positive. This is how we're going to do it. And let's be proactive. And, you know, he doesn't want versus me. I'll, I tend to get stuck in it. I tend to want to sink into the feeling and disappear into it when I'm not healthy and he is up, let's go, let's go. And so in that way, we are very, very good for one another because there are times where I'll ask him to sit with something for a minute longer than he might want to. Yeah. And there are times where he'll say to me, babe, you're stuck. Stop. Just, just do the next right thing. Get up and start doing the thing you know you need to do. Um, so he's a gift to me in that way. His wing is very balanced because he is a truth teller. I've seen him, I've, I've heard this is true. Maybe you can speak to this. I've heard that eights butt, can butt heads sometimes. Like an eight can smell out another eight in the room. Yes. Is that true? Yeah, but I also have some people that are eights that are in my life that are very different than me. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like yeah. the, I've, I know some eights that are like, I'm all in your face. Like, yeah. and I don't mean to be bad, like, or I don't mean that to be in a bad, but that's just how I come across. And I have a couple eights that are in my life that do not come across as, as I do. Okay. So, um, I don't necessarily, butt heads with eights. I have respect for anybody that tells it like it is like, I don't okay. care what your type is. I just have, I don't, the beating around the bush kind of thing. I don't have any patience for that. So I, it. that's, it's more of like, how do you show up is yes. Authenticity is what you respond to. Yeah. Okay. I, I see it. I've seen him bump up against other eights that I know in my life. And I've seen him, but he also has that worst case scenario side of his brain too, as an entrepreneur, which is so telling of the six. Mm -hmm. So I think he's really a very balanced wing. Well, that's he's good. a very healthy guy also. And so, you know, all of the types become more integrated, the healthier we get, we become recognized totally. from one another. Yeah. So he's just, he's a very healthy seven at this point. That's awesome. I yeah. love that. Yeah. I, and I think again, the more you learn about the Enneagram, and the more you learn about all the different types and you, if you decide that you're going to use this to help be the person that you were meant to be in the healthiest version, you will start to incorporate the best parts of all the types that you're connected to, which yeah. leads me to my next question. Yeah. So you, which, okay. So you've obviously played, I'm air quoting, you've played all the Enneagram types yeah. and you're a four. Yeah. Do you find, well, it's, it's a two part question. Okay. Part one is, do you find that you, if there's like a situation that maybe you're uncomfortable with, like that, you're like, okay, I'm going to channel, like if I were an eight, this is how I would respond to this. Or if I was uh, like, do you find that you ch intuitively or like um, intentionally channel other Enneagram types because you've done so much work in learning them, even if it was just for 
your audience? What a good question. I love this question. Okay. I don't know that I have ever at least consciously said I'm going to channel my inner two or channel my inner Mm -hmm. eight. However, I will tell you that studying the Enneagram has been very useful for me to learn. um, Feelings are not facts. And so I think as a tool, it's helped me to step back and just say, just because this feels real or because this feels like an emergency in my body, whatever's going on, doesn't mean it is. Let's gather facts. Let's gather facts is my new favorite like life mantra. Let's gather the facts uh, before we <laughs> react. So I, I think it's really helped me to do that, which is, which is rather a one trait, I mm-hmm. would say, moving toward um, what you know versus what you feel. And fours do move toward one as they get healthier yep. and more self-aware. So maybe that's the closest version I've experienced to say, okay, move toward that one, engage the one, you know, you can go that way, you can do it. Yeah. Um, that's yeah, maybe a bit of that. Oh, what a good question though. I love that so much. Okay. Well, cause I, and I know, and I, you're the only person so far that I've asked that question to. And I, cause I know for myself, I, like I said, I'm like very tried and true eight and I am trying to, I'm, I'm constantly trying to channel my nine wing. I'm constantly Mm -hmm. like intentionally trying to take a step back, take a breath because I'm very reactionary by nature. Like that's my gut is to just react and respond. And I'm trying to like, I'm always consciously going, okay, how would nine react in this? Like to hit the pause button. So anyway, I was just like, I'm going to ask her that question. Um, the journey for the eight is a journey back to innocence is what I heard once. And I ooh. love that because you feel like as the eight, you feel like, um, you have to always, you have to be the strong one because no one's going to show up and save me. Right. There. Yes. A hundred percent. So yes. I have to show up and save everyone else. And again, or I just have to save myself. I just have to save myself. I mean, I want to save like people, but I'm not, yes, it is. But it's just like you, it's just very much a like self-preservation. Yeah. To learn how to trust, to learn how to have that childlike faith again is, yeah. is your journey. And vulnerability for an eight. Yes. They know? go hand in hand. Yeah. There's no one more vulnerable than a child. They need you every moment for everything, right? Yeah. Versus the eight who says, I have it because I have to have it. Yep. Yep. No, so true. So I want to, we're going to take a a two second break. When we come back, I want to talk to you a little bit about organization in your life, because again, homeschooling mom organized has to be, or, you know, business owner, entrepreneur, like all these things, how do you as a four, what strategy? So we're going to talk about that. So sit tight, everybody. We'll be right back. Okay. So I've been dying to ask you this question because Again, I'm very much stereotyping and generalizing, but because fours are feeling dominant, they are doing repressed, meaning that of the three centers, thinking, feeling, doing, they struggle with doing. So the execution is oftentimes difficult for fours. And I've seen this often with, when it comes to clutter and organization. Mm -hmm. So there are strategies that I've had to put in place, like with my kid and with other people that I work with that are fours, whether it's like checklists, timers, things of that nature to help kind of keep them on track and not get sucked into the abyss of feeling and emotion. Mm -hmm. So knowing that, and I don't know if you agree with that or if that resonates with you at all, but well, does it, I guess I should ask, does it resonate with you? Make sure I'm on the right track. Okay. Absolutely. It does. So how do you, how do you keep it all together as a four? Well, I don't, but I can tell you, <laughs> I can, Perfect. Yeah. I, yeah. I can tell you what helps. Yes. So I, I alluded to this earlier and it's part of the reason that I am now fully sober and that we are a fully sober house is because for me, I, I have learned there is wisdom in making choices that de-amplify emotion, not amplify mm. Alcohol is throwing gasoline on anxiety. It feels great in the moment, but if I'm an anxious person, person, excuse me, which I am, I am I'm not doing myself any favors by drinking right. in a way that is becoming a crutch. And so um, clutter for me is another really good example of that. When you look around your home and your home feels out of control, chaotic, there's piles everywhere, there's mental to-do lists accruing, 
your cortisol is spiked. I don't have time for that. I'm not do I'm not playing that game. My stuff doesn't get to cause me stress. Mm -hmm. So I think for me, I take an aggressive stance with my household clutter. And as an eight, you'll probably appreciate this. I do. I, do. Yes. I have no tolerance for it. I don't, I don't ever let my stuff look. I have my people that I need to love and care for. I have my priorities. Stuff is at the bottom of that totem pole, right? Of priorities. So I would say decluttering is your first line of defense in virtually every category. However streamlined you think you are, give it another spin, treat it like an onion and go through again and say, what is sucking up my time and my energy on a daily basis? Because as you pointed out, for a lot of us are wearing multiple hats. This is not just me. There's no super mom thing going on here. I also have wonderful support. I have a husband who is who is loving and supportive and passes the baton with me. I have grandparents locally who help me and love me. We have two wonderful co-ops. So I'm not a superwoman. Um, I have wonderful support. Um, and I also have de-amplified the areas of my life that were causing me stress and anxiety. So my number one piece of advice, if we're talking about physical clutter. Yeah, well, we we get, we talk about physical clutter, emotional clutter, calendar yeah. clutter. So you can sure. touch on whichever one you want. Cause it all start with physical clutter then yeah. since we're here, my number one tip is get rid of most of it, get rid of almost all of it <laughs> seriously. Yeah. And don't, don't make it, a, it doesn't have to be an emotional process. Make your, your containers, whatever your closet is, whatever your home is, or your life is the containers, the bad guy, it either fits in here in a way that is honoring the sort of natural limitations of this space, or it doesn't. And if it doesn't fit, it has to go. It actually doesn't matter what it is. It just has to go. <laughs> So once you kind of get into that place where your sanity, you're prioritizing your peace of mind and your sanity and the ease of use of your home so that it can be freed up to work for you. Our home should be working for us so that we can be generous, hospitable, flexible, adaptable. Um, I always say my homeschool room is minimal enough that I could turn it into a guest room in a second if somebody I loved needed a safe place to come sleep. I shove a desk to the side, I blow up an air mattress and it is now a guest room. But I've I've tamed it. I'm putting that in air quotes. I have tamed yeah. that space to work for me. If I kept everything in there and I kept everything I acquired because, oh, I might need those really specific Greek flashcards one day in two years, then I don't have that. I, I've lost the adaptability. So I'm officially on a rant at this point. I realize that, but that's no, I point. love it. Ditch it. Ditch the stuff. Okay. But I have a, now, can I ask you a follow up question? No. Because this is, that's a very evolved very black and white response. And I love it. I love everything about it. Um, and again, broad stroke generalizing seem yeah. very extreme or counterintuitive for the gray of the four that sits in things. So is this something that you were always like this, like as a child, were you like this? Or is this something that over time, as your life got more busy and more, like you said, more important priorities came into play that you just made a decision. Like I have to, something's got to give and it's going to be the clutter. Both. I was naturally organized as a child, but as we've brought more children into our home and as our, as the things that God has asked us to do has continued to expand, I've become more ruthless and more, more black and white, as you pointed mm -hmm. out about the things that are not allowed to absorb my time or energy. Um, and that's true on the calendar too. I've become a more ruthless editor of my calendar. I can't show up well to everything across the board. I can't, right? And um, it's true of digital clutter. It's true of mm -hmm. clutter in all categories for me. I have become more dogmatic about this because it works for me. I've seen it as a protection. So the same way that piles and piles of things all around my home would cause me to feel very, very stressed out. And it might, that might not be the case for everybody. Some people, their mind works that way. And as long as they know where everything is, they can have peace. They have their order and their order looks different than mine. And that's an important caveat. That doesn't mean your house needs to look empty, but it does mean your house shouldn't stress you out. Mm -hmm. So whatever your natural limit is, you've got to find it. And then you've got to honor that for yourself. And I really do feel strongly about that. And I, I do, I agree with you. And I think it's so important when you're talking about people who live with other people, whether it's roommates or it is a spouse or families, when you have people that 
the clutter doesn't stress them out. The physical clutter doesn't stress them out. And you live with somebody that it does, it causes that anxiety. That's where I think it's really helpful to be able to have language that the Enneagram has been able to provide mm -hmm. to say, it's not just, be, it's not just that you leave your stuff on the, you know, your stuff around. It's not that there's piles of paper, but that actually is causing me feelings of overwhelm and anxiety. And to be able to articulate that, I think is really important because there are some people that what I call kind of clutter blind, you know, they just can walk past it and it doesn't bother yeah. them. But when you cohabitate with people, it's not, it has to be more like you, you have to find that happy medium of where am I going to, where am I allowed to be messy and, you know, disorganized and where do we need to maintain some sanity so that we can, as a cohesive unit, find that piece. Yes. And to, to cycle back to the why for just a moment, if I could, of course, it, my house looks messy every single day. So <laughs> I, don't, I don't want anyone to watch this and be like, Oh my gosh, this chick is like uptight about her space. Like the reason that I have minimized so ruthlessly is so my children can flip over couch cushions and make a fort is so that I want counters clean so that I can bake with my kids. I want it's, it's being, it's being kept a certain way so that it can be useful. Not so that it can be, my house is not a showpiece. Like we're very rough on our furniture. Um, things get chipped, things get dented and scratched. I have four children, three of them are boys. Like we go hard in our house, we just do. Yeah. So it's all about the why. Why am I getting rid of these things that are not serving me? And what do I intend to let the space be used for instead? How is it better used? That's the really important question. It's not, you're not more virtuous. There's no morality attached to how few how many pairs of shoes you have. Well, like and you, and right. you don't, and you don't win any awards for being a minimalist either. No, and no. I tell that to people all the time and I do. And I love that you said the whole, like, so that piece. And so I'm, I'm a big Dave Ramsey junkie. So you do. Oh, you are. I was listening to him this morning while I was back. Yes. Oh I love Ramsey. So, um, and my audience knows that Rachel's been on my show before. And so anyway, but okay. I, um, I love, cause he talks about that. Like wanting to get out of debt there has to be a bigger why yes. why it's not just to watch your bank account grow it's so that you can be more generous it's so yes. that you can have peace when something happens so that and it's the same there's so many parallels that kind of his teaching and principles and the way that I do things and what we do is it's got to be more than the stuff we're not just getting rid of it to get rid of it it's the freedom that comes from not having, not having to waste an hour looking for something. Yes. And putting that yes. system, because I always tell people the whole purpose of any organizing system isn't about putting it away. It's the ease of retrieval. How quickly can mm -hmm. I get it when I need it? Yes. It's not about, oh, my house is organized because everything is shoved in drawers and closets and it's surface. It's right. my, and I always tell the story where my older daughter who was a basketball player, she was doing this project in her senior year of high school. And it was like, Zoe's a basketball player through the years. And I have like a photo box for each of my kids for all their school and activity photos. Mm -hmm. So every year, you know, it comes in the mail. Well, I don't know what homeschooling parents do, but like it comes in the mail and you, you know, you get the school pictures, you probably have a co-op yeah. picture. Yes, and yeah. so I had, you know, her basketball pictures from, you know, the memory mate from kindergarten till, you know, through her high school senior year. And she was able to just go and get that or go to Shutterfly and download the pictures. So it wasn't, oh, look at my mom. She's so organized. It's this project took her 10 minutes, right? Where right. somebody else spent hours looking for it. So whenever you're doing something and you're going to store it, well, are you going to know where it is? Are you even going to want it? Why are we doing it? And that's what I always come back to when it comes to clutter and organization is yeah. it's the ease of retrieval and that's the freedom. And so when you're making decisions, to me, that's, that's really what the driving force is. And that I, to, you know, to me, that's really what it's all about. All of this. And if you can use the knowledge of the Enneagram and now knowing where your natural God-given strengths are and where you may struggle a little bit and then apply those strategies to say, okay, I know this about myself. I know I have a tendency. I just got done recording in the conversation with a Enneagram six and she was talking mm -hmm. about the fear and the anxiety. Mm -hmm. And 
now that you know that and you can name it, okay, so what do we do about it? What kind of guardrails can we put into place? So if you're four and you know that you are somebody that might struggle with these, what can you do? And I'm one, go ahead, you answer that. Oh, wait, no, no. Specifically, I just want to clarify the question with emotional attachments. Yeah, sure. Yes. Okay. I would say if you're going to, if you're somebody, it depends who I'm talking to. If you're okay. somebody who feels like I just need a whole overall home declutter. I'm feeling very overwhelmed by my stuff in general. I would never, ever tell someone like that to start with emotional items. Oh, I would say go to a bathroom and declutter one bathroom, declutter your front hall closet, like start, start in the places that are not emotional because learning to trust that you're going to be okay without something actually is a skill, which as you have pointed out, I have, I have refined and strengthened to a razor sharp point, but uh, which is why I come across intense when I start decluttering. I'm sorry if I do, but I, uh, at the same time, I would say you need to work up your muscles so that you learn it, it actually is okay if I let go of this thing. The minimalists have a rule, which I found helpful, which is the 2020 rule. Mm -hmm. So if something, if you're not, if you never have plans to use this item again, and if the item can be replaced in 20 minutes for under $20, and again, you have no plans to use it. I'm not talking about getting rid of your screwdriver or, you know, or something like that. Um, I'm not talking about being wasteful. Um, let it go. Let it go. Mm -hmm. It's going to be okay. If, if you have no plans to use it again in the next few years, you, mm -hmm. you're going to be fine without it. Now, when you come to emotional clutter, there's a couple of different things you can do. Um, number one is take a photograph of items. If there's just something that you think I might like to look at this thing again someday, taking a picture of something is a great way to feel like you still have access to it. But if you don't have the space or the desire or the funds to maintain the physical item, that's a great way to let it go. Also being really intentional about where you let things go can be very, very helpful. Um, if you can bless somebody with an item that you're not using, or if you can find a great crisis shelter where gently used clothing, you know, are gonna, they're going straight to somebody who's gonna benefit from them. Then it becomes very joyful to let go, um, totally. becomes easier. Um, as opposed to just dropping a bag off somewhere that would, that can feel very impersonal to some people. It takes longer, uh, but you can also sell things. If you feel like, you know what, I really want to reclaim some of this. If you feel like it was a purchasing mistake or you spent too much money on the item and that's causing you to feel a little stressed out about letting it go, it's okay to let it sit in the closet and list it, list it and, you know, get some of the money back. And I think that can be a good strategy for certain personality types as well. But ultimately the phrase, from the minimalists, the, the memory is not in the item, is very mm -hmm. helpful. Holding on to my grandmother's uh, mink fur doesn't bring my grandmother back. Mm -hmm. um, every now and then, yeah, you might touch it and feel close to her for an instant, but that's not her. My memories of my grandmother are here. They're inside of me. They're a part of me. She's with me. I carry her. And there's no, um, there's no item that gets to store her for me, what she meant to me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That can be very freeing as well. Just to remember, there's nothing that can remove these memories from me. They're inside. I love that. All right. I'm going to ask you one more thing before we go. So talk to me a little bit about calendar clutter about, again, mm -hmm. you talked a little bit about, um, you know, being ruthless with your time and prioritizing things. I know, and again, I'm going back to my own personal experience, raising a four and some of the other fours that are in my life, um, losing track of time, being very intense with stuff is, is a oftentimes a struggle. So yeah. there, there have to be some parameters, some checklists, some guardrails that are put into place to kind of keep them on the path. Right. A, have you found that to be true for you? And if so, like, what have you done to help to kind of continue to practice building that muscle? The muscle of uh, calendar. Of, yeah. Of, of, yeah. Of keeping that at bay of kind of like not overcommitting yourself, not, um, mm. you know, making sure that you're spending appropriate times. I think all of us, regardless of your Enneagram type, we all struggle in this day and age with some level of calendar clutter because we live in this 24 hour world where there's always stuff going on and there's so many things to say yes to. And we oftentimes underestimate the amount of time something's going to take us. So we're like, sure, I could do that. And then we add more and more. It's like, and I always give the, the analogy of 
every time you say yes to something, it's like adding another piece of clothing into your closet without taking anything out. And so eventually, you know, you keep adding things to your closet, keep adding. And then all of a sudden your closet is bursting. And that's what happens with a lot of people with calendar clutter. And I know for a lot of times, certain types really struggle with that time management piece. And you obviously have gotten to a point where you are razor sharp with running that. But for somebody that's not there yet, but wants to strive to do that, how can they intuitively with their characteristics of their Enneagram forness, um, start to build that muscle, start to say no, start to have those boundaries? Yeah. Um, if Michelle heard you ask that question or my husband, either of them would laugh because they know how I struggle with my character. <laughs> um, this is this has been the most useful guideline for me, I will say. So if, if I were to walk you through my house right now, in any given closet, I have sort of just an unspoken rule with myself that there needs to be 20% white space. So like 20% of the shelf space is empty. 20% of the hanging bar is empty. So that clothes are not like, that's just sort of a, a magical number for me is like 20% white space, totally unplanned. I love that. And I use that same principle for my calendar. So whatever, however long I think my school day should take with a mm -hmm. fifth grader, a third grader, a preschooler, and a baby, I add 20% to it. I add in breathing room everywhere. The kids can have after school, after homeschool activities, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, but not Monday and not Friday. And the weekends are under scheduled, not unscheduled, but under scheduled because I want to be able to say yes to spontaneous fun things as well. Um, we want to be able to make those fun memories as a family. So I would say leaving just a little more breathing room than you think is really the key. Um, now, in terms of how to say no, saying no is actually quite easy for me. <laughs> right now. Um, I don't know if that was always the case. I'm trying to think back to it. Maybe I had a little more FOMO in college <laughs> and my first time around through motherhood. But again, the more people we've brought into the home, the more I crave the white space, I go out of my way to create it. I am less afraid of hurting people's feelings if I have to say no to something because I, tr I trust in my relationships now, you know, sure. if you, if you, someone cares about you and you have to say no to their child's birthday party, the, they understand, right? If this is somebody who's been in my life a long time, they understand, um, but also showing up when it's most important. So for me, that little bit of breathing room has been, has been very key for that. I think that's so gold. I'm going to absolutely, and I will throw credit your way, but I think that is really, really a valuable piece because it's something that I try to do with my physical space, but I don't always articulate that to people. And I love that you articulate and kind of put that that loose parameter around it. Um, and by calendar, I just call it building in margin. But yeah. again, I love it where <clears throat> when we cram our things back to back to back to back, you leave no room for the detour, for the accent, for your computer to reboot itself, for all yeah. of the, you know, what all these different things that come up, the kid having a sick day or, uh, yes. you know, whatever it is. And so I've learned my own through my own trial and error to build margin into my calendar. Cause I think for me as an Enneagram eight, that's probably where I struggle the most. You love Dave Ramsey. So you'll appreciate this. What's baby step number three. <coughs> build an baby emergency seven. fund. If I'm done choking. <laughs> After done choking on my own saliva. <laughs> <laughs> you, but you got it. It's build your three to six month Month's emergency, emergency fund. fund. Yeah. So my budgeting in this margin is your emotional emergency fund. It Absolutely. is it's your safety lever. Um, I like to think of it that way. Yeah, no, it's so, so true. Okay. So I want to just say, it, is there anything else you've given so, so many great nuggets of wisdom, but before we go to our final break, any other words of wisdom or insight that you want to share for either your fellow Enneagram fours or maybe somebody that's parenting a four, lives with a four, married to a four, whatever, um, on how they can be the best version of themselves. This answer is gonna sound awfully cheesy and trite and I'm really sorry, I don't mean it to, but get in the Bible and read it. There is so much wisdom in that book. I 
even if you're not someone who identifies as a Christian today, read Proverbs. The, the Bible has so much eternal wisdom about how we're supposed to spend the precious time that we have here on earth. Mm. Um, nothing has changed my life like spending time in that book. Nothing, nothing else I've ever done. And so I don't mean to say cheesy when you say, what's the piece? Of I was like, that's, that's not cheesy. I thought you were going to be like, love yourself and read the Bible. I don't, I don't mean it to sound like this big blanket. Cause I, I know, I know no. it can sound like a cliche to say it, but I say it with my whole being, read the Bible. Honestly, if you do mm-hmm. nothing else, if you hear nothing else from me, it has changed my life. Mm-hmm. And that is what I would want you to hear more than anything else. I love it. I mean, I- I, who else can, I can't stop Jesus. Let's go. We'll try. <laughs> and we're going to mic drop there. So before we take our last break to do, come back for a wrap up questions, tell our listeners, where's the best place that they can find you, learn more, follow you, all the things. Yeah. Uh, DeeringStudio.com is home base for a lot of my creative endeavors. That's the acting school I run with my husband, but also on YouTube, you can follow Deering Studio and Top Knot Comedy, K-N-O-T, like like the classic yes. mamba and the top knot. Um, yeah, those are some great places to find us. And we're also top knot comedy on Instagram as well. And of course, for all of our listeners, you know, we'll link up to everything in our show notes. And so you can find everything that we talked about there as well. Um, Leanne, we're going to take one more quick break and then just put you in for our wrap up question. So sit tight. All right. This has been such a great conversation, super insightful. And I just, love chatting with you. I really do. So thank you so much. And thank you for saying yes for in a world of all these commitments. Thank you for saying yes and coming on our show. That means a lot to me. And I think our listeners are going to get so many, so much valuable wisdom from this. So thank you. I mean, it was yeah, a the, the only problem is now I want to talk with you about closets for like 45 minutes. We, so come back we, on. We're so going we to, can... we're going to definitely do that. Um, I, there's so much that we need to talk about. Um, Okay. So our wrap up questions okay. in this, um, actually, I'm going to, let me, let me back that up for a second. So is there a book that you, and you might say the road back to you, but it doesn't have to be a, a book that has been, and you could say the Bible too, a book that's been transformational in your life that you maybe refer to other people, but we like to link up to that in our show notes. So Mm -hmm. what is something, but it could be something lighthearted. It could be a kid's book. It doesn't have to be, but something that we want to leave our listeners with in terms of a little piece of Leanne. There is a kid's book. Hold on. I'm going to give you, I, uh, yes, I'm going to say the Bible and the road back to you have both been highly, highly transformational. Um, There is a children's book. It's really funny that you said that, that I read um, Miss Rumpheus with my children. Are you familiar with it? No, I'm not. Is it new? My kids are old. It's not that new. Okay. It is. If you have a child in your life that you love, I think it is the most perfect children's book I've ever read in my entire life. It's called Miss Rumpheus. And it's about a woman who decides she's going to make the world more beautiful. And that's all I'm going to say. Okay. I am linking up to it and I'm probably, I'm just going to go buy it because that's, and I I will, I'm going to read it and then I'll probably just gift it to somebody. So there you go. Um, we will link up to all of those things. Um, okay. And then this is our final two wrap up questions. Okay. In this particular season of your life as a homeschooling mom of four, busy working mom, where do you feel the most organized and where do you feel like a little bit of a hot mess? You ask such good questions. Okay, I my kitchen is so in order. I'm very proud of my kitchen systems because it's kind of a small, it's like a galley style kitchen. Mm -hmm. So I have to be really methodical. And I think I've like got it down. (laughs) Maybe we should do a kitchen tour next time. Well, well, yeah, I was like, we can definitely do a kitchen tour. I'm very proud of my kitchen. I'm very proud of my homeschool room because again, I'm not willing to let minutes be sucked from my day looking for your Latin book. We need to know where things are and (laughs) if everything needs to flow. Oh, okay. I guess the place I'm the most disorganized across categories would probably be digital. I don't have uh, as efficient a filing system in the computer as I wish I did right now. Okay. That's, that's fair. I like it. It's fair and it's very common. So yeah. Digital clutter. It's like the hidden clutter. It's our hidden. Yeah. I know. 
Leanne, thank you so much. First of all, I'm going to be, I should say, first of all, but last of all, I'm going to be in Scottsdale in November. What? Yes. I host a retreat. So I, part of what I do in addition to this show is I um, coach and mentor other professional organizers. And so we have this group, it's called the SBO partner program. And every year we do a retreat because we're all over the country. So once a year, we go to a different place and we are going to be in Scottsdale in November for this year's retreat. Yeah, I'm coming. I'm inviting myself. Oh my God. You are invited. And I want to know, like, are you, I want, are you guys performing? I have to find out if you guys are performing. I want to come see you guys. Yeah. Or like, we'll do a 20 minute set at your organizing event. Sold. Done. Oh my gosh. I love it. <laughs> it's so fun. Okay. Give me dates. Yeah, I will. Give, give I will. Yes, we will be there. We will be there November the 3rd to the 6th. And we will be talking all about it. And you, yes, you guys are, you're hired. How fun. Oh my goodness. Yes. I'm very I would excited. Love it. Yes. Um, and so if you're out there and you're a professional organizer and you want to learn more about our partner program and maybe come to Scottsdale and meet up with Leanne, shoot us a note. Um, if this is your first time tuning into our show, welcome. We love having you here. We're on YouTube. We are on every podcast streaming app, this Organized Life podcast. You can follow us there, link up to us. Um, if you're looking for any of our other services, other professional organizers, digital courses, all that, found it at simplybeorganized.com. And until next week with our Enneagram Fives. I'm Lori Palau. Peace out. Thanks for tuning in. If you like this episode, please spread the love and share it with your friends. And if this is your first time joining us, make sure to click the subscribe button wherever you are listening so you never miss an episode. And while you're there, please leave us a review so other people know that our show is worth the listen. You can also find us on YouTube and Instagram at This Organized Life Podcast. And if you'd like to connect with us, you can head on over to our website at simply the letter B like boy organized.com, which is filled with tons of resources, including free downloads, checklists, links to our amazing organizing partners and all of our digital offerings. I'll see you next week for another episode of This Organized Life.